Welcome back to the weekly GMBN Tech Show. This week, coming up on a show, we've got some information about great tech products, and of course, we've got all the usual stuff. So this week we're going straight in with tech news. There's a whole bunch of products I want to tell you about. Seeing some of this stuff online, being sent some of these really cool products, and I've also been to the UK trade show and checked out some in the flesh. So first up, we've got the O'Neill B50 magnetic goggles. So that is your regular pair of goggles, but they've got magnetic lens system. So you basically don't have to fiddle around popping the lens in and out, which smears them and scratches them. They literally just pop on and off, depending on which one you want. Now I check these goggles out and they come in two options. They come the standard, which just comes with a single lens. That's normally a mirrored lens. And then there's the Pro Pack. Now in the Pro Pack, there's the goggles, 10 tear offs, mud flap system, a clear spare lens, a blue spare lens, a red spare lens, and a pouch for it all. Now, they're really, really good goggles and the lens sort of real estate they have is absolutely huge. So there's a lot of good vision for you, but they do come at a price. So. Just a standard option, about 90 euros with a single lens, but the Pro Pack, you're talking just under 200 euros. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm all for the tech, but I'm very much of the opinion that goggles should be cheap. So some information, brand new news is Nuke Proof have got the Horizon wheel set out. So Horizon is their high-end range of products. They do pedals already in that clipless and flats. And then they've got these new wheels. So they come in 29 and 27 and a half, and both for enduro and downhill application. So each hub and rim, they're laced with Sandvik double butted spokes, got brass nipples, and each set of wheels come with eight spare spokes. So that's really thinking of the end user. There's an 84 point engagement with a 4.2 degree pickup on there, and I've got 29 millimeter internal rims that have been developed in conjunction with WTB. So you know they're gonna be good quality stuff. Again, they represent really great value, like the identity wheels we talked about on last week's show, and the US price for a set of those wheels is $486, in the UK is about 350 quid, and in Europe that's 440 euros. So nice one to those guys for developing a really good sort of flexible wheel package with a real nice high-end feel. Next up, I've been looking at Tyler McCall's Instagram. Now Tyler's definitely one of the most stylish riders out there, and he's been on GT for a while, and you know what he's like on a bike, but he's just released his two pictures of his new bike. Now one of the things I really like about his bikes is the black frames, and then he's got the old school looking tan wall tires. Now, somehow, even though they're not black, they do manage to make the bike look quite mean and very long as well. But what I really like is on his downhill bike, he's got a pair of Fox 40s on there, painted red with Marzocchi Bomber decals on. Now, as you know, the Marzocchi Group were purchased by Fox, so they're kind of like a sister company now, and they're using the same factories and production facilities and stuff. And some of the riders, like Tyler, are having a bit of fun with that, because I guess he really likes the roots of what Marzocchi did in the free ride world. And he's showing that off with a pair of the downhill Fox 40s with Marzocchi get up on him. Check them out. Now next up, I was checking out G Atherton's new race bike when I was at Core Bike Show. Now, as you know, he's on Trek, but he's got a few different sponsor changes for 2018. So the first immediate one, when you walk into the room and see the bike, is he's got a pair of Renthal bars and stem and grips on there. So it's all changed. So that's a brand new setup up front for him there. And it's kind of nice to see him on the brand. It's a British brand, a lot of sort of racing history and pedigree there. But of course, what he's running previously was Pro, and that's a Shimano sort of range of products. So you look at the bike, he's got no Shimano products on there at all. So he's running a partial SRAM system, but also with Hope. So he's got Hope brakes on there, Hope cranks, and he's got a Hope seat post. So it's a real trick looking bike with a few different extra things on there. We were looking at the tires on there, the Bontragers as well, and those things are like super tacky. You'd love to have a look at those at some point. So the next one is a bit of a throwback for me actually. Panaracer, a tire company, have re-released or reissued the smoke and dart tire combination. So in the 90s, one of the tires that worked, like bearing in mind it was Farmer John's nephews and a whole bunch of stuff that just simply didn't work, was the smoke. So the Panaracer smoke was a, a rear tire, although when it first came out, it used in front and rear, very open paddle based design. Really good and a lot of tires today take a lot of that sort of information and carcass design straight through. Now Panaracer have opened up the Japanese original moulds and they're remaking those exact tyres. They're not even replicas, they are exactly the same as they used to be. 
and you can buy them in the regular 26 by 2.1 size and also the front edition which is the dart so the, the idea between the two was your rear one was all about driving your front one was about steering control really progressive design and it's great to see them back so i know there's gonna be a lot of retro lovers out there getting those tires for your retro bike builds because tires of that era if you still got them they're likely to be perished so you can get brand new versions with tan walls and it's a real deal so a couple of weeks back on the show i was asked about the giro chamber chew and of course that's a really popular shoe anyway with a gum sole on it it looks a bit more like a skate shoe quite a robust thing now for 2018 they've got their new model out so it's a revised sole on there the upper is slightly more lightweight on it it's a bit of an improvement i actually think it's a really nice looking shoe now I didn't get to see all the colorways, but this is one of them and it's pretty damn nice, gotta tell you. But the shoe that actually impressed me more was previously they had the jacket, which was their flat pedal shoe, but it was a bit more of just a trainer to start with, a bit more like a skate shoe. So great if you work in the bike industry perhaps and you want something to wear to work that looks less like a cycling shoe and more like a trainer, but not quite as good out on the trails. Now the new one is called the Riddance and this is perfect for you flat pedal guys out there. So it's got Kind of a mid cut they do do a low one as well but the mid is the real mountain biker shoe it's got an upper strap for keeping everything secure you can tuck the laces under that so nothing's going to get caught in your drivetrain it's got a slightly softer compound vibram rubber sole on there that looks a lot better than the first incarnation which was a good sole but this is certainly going to be grippier on the pedal now the inside of the ankle has got raised protection there as well from that dreaded smash on the cranks and they just look so nice I want a set of those, they look wicked. USC, which stands for Ultimate Sports Engineering, were a company that had been on the British mountain biking scene for many years. And they were really famous initially for making seat posts. They did them in anodized colors and it was a single size post of different lengths available and you shimmed them out and they sold the shims as well. Now they've been reproducing a lot of really, really cool stuff, but I noticed when I was looking at their seat post, they've got a brand new post called the Helix, which is a dropper post. So it kind of felt logical for them to do that because they kind of developed the same sort of concept in the past with their suspension seat posts. So they already had the telescopic thing down, but it was more focused on comfort rather than a performance thing. Now the Helix post is gonna be available in 125 and 165 mil drops in the usual 30.9 and 31.6 mil. They did tell me that there's gonna be a 27.2 at some point down the line, but due to the narrow size of that, it's gonna take a little bit more refining just to make sure they're happy with it before it goes to production. The operating lever itself kind of reminds me of the Crank Brothers one. Really nice position on the bar. You've got the barrel adjuster on there and this little ball socket so you can move it around to your preferred position. But the thing that's really cool about the Helix is it's got a clutch design inside. So it's infinite drops. You can have it wherever you want. And it's actually got like a return adjustability speed on it via the air valve that's just under the seat clamp. So you can adjust how fast you want it to come up. Personally, I like them the faster the better so I can constantly adjust while I'm riding. Some people don't like that, they want it to be a bit slower. With the USC Helix, you can pick it your way. So that's a really nice product. Now it seems these days that everyone likes to strap more stuff to their bikes and carry less on their person. And that's kind of been led by the races of the Enduro World Series. And for good reason as well, because that stuff, for, for example, like an inner tube that's just strapped under your saddle rails or on the frame, it's a really fast access. So you've got puncture, you can get it done super fast, get back on the trail. Now I was checking out this Cannondale, and Cannondale's got their own little sort of retention straps now to hold an inner tube, a couple of CO2 cartridges just in the sort of nook of the frame there. Now that's really neat, but I also noticed on this particular one at the show, they had the fabric cageless bottle, but under the cage mount they had a pump bracket. And the pump bracket seemed to hold perfect size fabric tool on there as well. It's just a nice example of carrying everything you need on the bike, nothing on your body, hit the trails free. Feels really good. So we've been using Ergon grips here for some time and I've, I'm quite a big fan of them, especially the fact that the GD1s, you can get them in different sizes. So when I ride abroad, places like Whistler or the Alps, I like to go for the bigger grip, which is a bit more comfortable because I do have a previous wrist injury. So it flops around a bit and sometimes I have to wear wrist support. So I'm always looking out for the next thing. Now I've got a new grip called the GA3, which has got a slight wing on the back of it. Now Ergon used to make a lot of comfort grips for the commuter bike market and endurance cross country style grips with built on bar ends and those sort of wings. Now this is new enduro sort of all mountain version of that grip. So it's a high performance grip made out of soft rubber. There's various different options available, but it's got this wing on it. Now, a lot of riders are not gonna like this sort of thing, but personally, it looks perfect to me. So I'm gonna get a set of these and I can actually see myself having that on the right and a, and a GD1 on the left, just a little bit of support for the heel of my hand where I need it. So just something to factor in if you have got any sort of injuries yourself.
Okay, so now it's time to look at what you were talking about on last week's show, so comments and down to you guys. Um, of course, we were talking about what sort of bike tape do you take for granted and what stuff do you think you can't live without? So first up, Bike MTB says, I think suspension is the best thing to mountain biking as you can unscrew your saddle or pull your brakes harder, but nothing helps more on a black rock garden than a 150 mil front shock. Um, my arms thank the inventor. Yeah, do you know what? I do agree with that. Suspension is phenomenal what you can do off-road, but I stand by my original thought that I think the dropper post is actually more beneficial in the long run because you have a dropper post on a rigid frame and it really helps your ability to get off away from the saddle, keep your center of gravity low. But of course, this is a preference thing and this is why we talking to you guys about it. In response to yours, um, Bike MTB says Al Jolin, with rim brakes, you can't just pull them harder. If they get wet and muddy, you are not stopping no matter how hard you pull. Do you know what? I remember the terrifying days of really poor rim brakes, especially cantilevers. Flying down a hill, you reach for the brakes and literally for a split second, nothing happens. Oh God, never again. Give me disc brakes any day. Water bottle. I don't have any of that tech that you named. I live without all of it. I've got a hardtail with 60 mil of front fork travel. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah, there's horrible V-brakes and no dropper post and flat pedals. But I go out and ride every trail possible, every minute I get. Yeah, do you know what? That's the best way to be. Tech doesn't actually matter at the end of the day. This is all the stuff that we like to enhance the way we ride, but you don't need any of this stuff. You can just get out and ride on any bike. So that's a great response, I like that. Tom Eichelenboom. Hey Dolly, can you do a video about hanging your 3x9 drivetrain to a 1x11 drivetrain? Great video, keep up the good work. Yeah, actually that's a really good idea. I'm definitely gonna do that one. We're gonna get a few more budget bikes in and show how to get the best sort of maintenance stuff and how you can improve those bikes and make them better for you guys. So doing three by nine to one by 11 is a great thing to do when you've worn out your transmission. You don't wanna do it straight away because it's just gonna cost you money, but in the long term, you're gonna get a good range of gears, but also save a bit of weight off your bike. So we'll definitely do that one. Florian. My dad told me a while ago, about 10 years back, when he bought a simple Simplon hardtail, he had the option to get the Shimano DRXC with dual control. Can you tell me a bit about this? Because it seems very unconventional. Loving the videos, by the way. Well, thank you for the video comment, that's great. Um, Shimano dual control, yeah, I think that one's uh, that's firmly gone. So in the road world, you have your brake lever hoods, and then on the hoods with the lever dangles down, you can change gear by pushing the shifter in and out. Now Shimano thought that was a good idea to bring this to the mountain bike market. And whilst they did work really well, you've got to bear in mind that when you're riding on an off-road situation, you need your brakes to pull in like this. As soon as your fingers are dangling around and bumping up and down the rough terrain, it's so easy to change gear accidentally. Add to this the fact it worked with rapid rise, so you change gear the opposite way around to normal. So let's just think about this. So if you change your gear normally, you're clicking down, you're expecting it to drop one way. Clicking up, you expect it to pull up the other way. You imagine that working the opposite way around. That combination with the dual control, bit of a nightmare to be honest. Although I do know two riders that still use that stuff and swear by it. And one of the things they do like is the rapid rise. Actually, it makes it really easy to change gear up into a lower gear when you're riding up steep hills because the spring works with you, not against you. So pretty cool stuff, but I think that's done and dusted as far as the mountain bike world goes. If you want to have shifters that work in that sort of way that all integrated into the bars, grip shift is really the better option, I think, and it weighs virtually nothing. Liam Moore, um, if you're building your own bike cave, as you say, you should do a series of videos about building it. Yeah, actually, I'm just gonna throw you to something now. Okay, so welcome to my unfinished workshop I'm still working on. As you can see in the corner, I've got stuff like the boiler boarded up in here. My bikes are gonna be on this wall. I've got this really cool industrial rubber flooring. So that's like chemical proof and all that stuff. Um, we're going to have a workbench all the way along the back here, L shape, having a sink on the top and a washing machine dedicated for bike stuff here, all the tools and that stuff. Outside I'm having a hot and cold tap with a hot shower head so I can get clean before I come into the house. And then up here this is going to be a plasterboard ceiling, um, hard to imagine as it is but it's going to have lights. I'm going to have hanging stuff on there as well and I've got a bit of storage up here as well for uh, various bike stuff. But I've actually been lucky enough to build this completely. So it was an old coal bunker with an outdoor toilet. And that's, that's the last remnants of what the toilet was. So to have a dedicated workshop, that kitchen, um, sorry, that window came from what was the old kitchen in the rest of the house. So we're recycling everything we can as well. And all the bricks used to build this are from other parts of the house that we knocked down during the build. So 
pretty cool. And I'll present an episode of the GMBA Tech Show from here when it's done. But that's all you're seeing for now. Nice. And the last one, oh, this is a big one. So Thomas Van Smell says, Doddy, I'm a father of five children. The oldest is 12, the youngest is three. I'm having a hard time finding good mountain bikes for kids. We, I, need better kids' bikes with parts we can replace and maintain so I can pass on my oldest son's bike to his younger brother. Even for children, a good lighter bike makes a lot of difference. Things I upgrade are 1x11, I mean 3x9 and square bottom bracket is just horrible and heavy. Better brakes, better rubber. Am I a snob? No, you're not at all actually. So you bear in mind how much stuff is on a mountain bike and when trying to keep that price point down and sort of compress them for kids' bikes, you're left with what fundamentally is a really heavy bike. So there are a few bike brands out there that simplify this and do this specifically for kids. There's a brand called Isla Bikes and that stems from Isla Roundtree who used to be a cross country pro rider. Now she's dedicated herself to making the best kids bikes from the early sort of walk along bikes all the way up to like 26 inch wheel bikes. Now check some of these bikes on screen they're developed specifically and specced for kids and lighter riders. Also British brand Hope that are famous for their brakes and anodized bits. They've got a thing called the Hope Academy. Now on the Hope Academy, it's a subscription-based bike sale service for kids. So the idea is you buy a bike for your kid. It's obviously quite a high-end bike, so it's a lot of money, but you subscribe, so you're paying a monthly cost. And when your child grows out of that bike, you simply trade it in for the next size up. And then they service the bike and it goes to another kid. So you're constantly paying a fixed fee and you've got the option of chopping and changing bikes as your children grow. Now that is a really cool service and I'd actually like to see that employed for more places because getting kids on bikes is a really expensive thing and not everyone can afford to, as you are, converting kids bikes with really good stuff like one by 11. I think kids should have that sort of right to have a decent bike and not be stuck on something really heavy. They're the future. Okay, now it's time for Bike Cave. You guys have been flooding us like yet again. Can't get you all in the show, unfortunately, but we are gonna start putting some of these on our Facebook page, so keep your eyes peeled if you haven't made it in. So first up is Connor Smith. Um, oh, nice, oh, you've got a dog in there as well. Half oh, Blake would love you if he was here. Nice tidy bench setup. Nice, oh, a bit of an old school Porsche in the background there. A bit of biking memorabilia, tires, 661 helmets. Nice, I particularly like your workbench setup. That looks pretty industrial. And you've got sofas, you can put a power nap if you need to. So Dan Whitley from Plymouth is next. Oh, that is nice. Oh, what's he got in there? Nuke Proof Scouts? Two of them. Oh man, you've got some nice bikes hanging up in there. Nice setup. So you've got some kids' bikes. Good man bringing in the future of mountain biking right there. EJ Bosley. Whoa. Now that is a crammed workshop. Race plates in here. I see some Gorilla tape back there. Paint. It's got all the lubes and stuff in the world. Shimano Mineral Fluid. Nice, you're definitely into your home mechanics if you've got all that gear. Even got envelopes, Santa Cruz 5010 parts. Santa Cruz H, I can't see what that says. Oh man, I love your setup. There's so much going on in there. I could spend a lot of time. Quite therapeutic in a place like that. Next up we've got Matthew Lilburn from Northern Ireland. Taking over your dad's garage. Yes, that is the way. Man, you've got some sweet bikes in there. You've got YT and a Cove. Nuke proof up the back. Man, how many bikes have you got? All right, good amount of tools as well. I can see some Stanley stuff down there. A roll cab, decent tool board. Man, you've definitely done your dad's garage justice. I can see some Alpine Stars boots there and a motocross tyre. Mm, looks like you're into some other good stuff too. Uh, Michael Risher. Hey GMBN, love the show and everything about it. For my setup, I've had to deal with a small space. So I've had to work out a double duty unit. So I've got a storage unit from Ikea, put it on rollers and screwed in a pegboard. Oh man, this is great. So. The front side of this unit, this, your regular sort of unit, you can put it up on its end for storing all your stuff in, and you flip it around, it's a pegboard with all your tools on. That is, that's a hack and a half. In fact, that should be a top mod. That is really good. In a workspace as well. Bike Cave meets top mods. Mountain Brothers. Here's my bike cave. I've got a Common Cell HT All Mountain Race in it, two fixed gear bikes, a trials bike, and a BMX. What else should I add? Dude, you could almost have an indoor track in there because the size of that garage is massive. You definitely need some posters and some artwork going on. I reckon a sofa in there. And judging by the amount of bikes, you get a beer fridge in there too. You could turn it into a proper den. Really into that. Definitely get some colour in there. Get that one nailed. What else we got? 
Oscar Berges, uh, love the new channel. Here's my bike cave, which also doubles as a home office. Well, what you mean is it's a bike cave and you just chucked a computer in the corner. Man with good priorities there. Got a wheel jig as well. Oh, definitely into home tinkering. Nice. Like the Orbea as well. It's a really nice colour you got there. Sweet. And last one is from Tony Chambers. I think I need to tidy up again. No, do you know what? You don't need to tidy it up. That looks wicked in there. Loaded. I can see a GMBN sticker on your cabinet as well. Oh, good man. Nice Santa Cruz you got there too. Sweet. Loving seeing those. Make sure you keep firing in your bike cave entries. Use the hashtag when you add them in on the comments below and when you fire them on an email. And of course, tag us on Instagram and Facebook as well. Love seeing that stuff. Okay, now it's time for Rewind. This is a retro corner of the show where we check out where stuff has come from and where it's going to, the development of parts, and of course, all your retro goodies. And we're still getting so many in that I'm having a bit of a break from telling you guys about this stuff because I'm just enjoying what you're sending in. So first up this week from Aaron. Uh, Aaron of Portsmouth, actually, I recognise your name. And once you said about your orangey too, I remember you entered that into Bike Vault and we gave that a super nice because I remembered the XT shark fin on there. So it's pretty cool that you're sending in some stuff. And the first one is now Bullet Brothers Chain Tensioner. So if you imagine pre-clutch mech days, this would basically go underneath your quick release on the back of the bike, poke out the back, and that spring would hold the cage of the mech up to give you loads of supreme chain tension and really silence the bike, help stop the chain coming off. It worked really well, but as a downside, they would knacker the springs in your rear mech after a while because there's so much sort of friction going through it. And also, if you remember, Using those in the long term, it'll actually make it really hard to change gear with your thumb because you're fighting that really powerful spring that comes on there. But great trip down memory lane. Next up, a pair of Shimano Dior thumb shifters. Seven speeds. Oh man, I remember those things. It's funny because I've got really good memories of them, but I did use some thumb shifters the other day and they're just, they're pretty crap really, you know, but they were so good at the time and it worked really well. Next one, I absolutely love a Gorilla Fork Brace. So this is like a brake booster. Back in the day when you started using more powerful cantilever brakes, what would happen on bikes is they're forcing the chain stays, sorry, they're forcing the seat stays or the fork apart so much so that your brake would feel spongy. So to retain that positive feel that you want from your brakes to get the most amount of power, a lot of aftermarket companies like Gorilla and Odyssey used to do them as well, made these brake boosters that would go on the front and they'd basically have big bolts that go straight through your brakes and into the brake bosses and hold it all together. Really nice, but it used to clog up. Do you remember that? Never that good that was. Uh, next up we've got Grave Sapaniak. Here's my retro ride, a 1998 Kona Stab. It's a bit of a crossover into your scratch build topic because I built the frame up sourcing original parts online. Yeah, do you know what? I, I remember these things as clear as day because I used to have Kona Stinky which came out just before these. And the Stinky was like a five and a half inch wheel travel bike. Stab I think was six. And it was loosely based around the Turner suspension system, although the Turner used to have the FSR link on the chain stays, whereas the Kona uses a, the faux bar style seat stay pivot. So it's not quite as active, but look at that paint job on it. It's got the old flames, it's got the big head tube gussets. Was that a Fox or was that a Nolene shock? I've got a feeling it might have been a Nolene on those. And you've got Junior T's up front. Man, those things were so nice when they came out. Super plush. And also notice on the front you've got big azonic stem on it, so called a shorty, but ironically it's a lot longer than the short stems of today. I see some Yeti handlebar grips on there, azonic rises, Magura, I don't know if they're HS33s or not, but Magura hydraulics, and they look like Mavic rims to me, the CD finish. What would they be, 131s maybe? Nice, nice effort, really into that. Next up, Tom Jackson, oh man, 1994 Fat Chance Buck Shaver. That is seriously nice. XTR in there. He's got smoke and dark tyres on there. That's probably from the first time round. That's pretty cool to see those. They're the tyres I talked about in news. And what pedals are they in there? You've got some sort of gnarly looking old pedals in there. Synchros stem, Pace RC35s with the reverse fork arch. Nice wishbone on the frame. That's a really, really nice sort of handmade steel frame. Well into that. Tony Spalding is next. Firstly guys, your shows are great. Informative for all levels. I thought I'd send this picture in for the Tech Rewind. It's me racing in the early 90s. Yes, I'm old. <laughs> nice work. Um, he's riding a Rocky Mountain Blizzard here, so that's really cool to see. In fact, I was looking at Rocky Mountains literally the other day. So if you look on screen, you can see a Rocky Mountain Blizzard. I managed to find one for 96 and another one for 93. I think your one 
it's hard to tell there, but it might be about 95 or something like that. Although you did say early 90s, but that's great to see that riding. Even though you're doing that thing that we all used to do back then, you've got what, city shoes on, you've got a specialized top, specialized helmet, and you're riding a Rocky Mountain. What's that all about? But either way, like so rad to see you out on the bike. And I do, I do like the way you said, I detest road cyclists, as I've always been a mountain biker, but I've now got a road bike last year for sprints and for my own training. You've got to get Doddy out on one for the show. I'm sure he can do it. Yeah, do you know what? Like, I'm not a stranger to road bikes. When I used to race cross country, I used to train on a road bike when I was a lot younger, so I do know what it's about and it's fine. It's just, to be honest, my riding time, like most people's, is pretty limited. And if I get a chance to ride in a day, I'm gonna ride a mountain bike every time, even if it is on road. I just love them. So straight into top mods and I'm really impressed. They're flying in now and they are ranging from all sorts of stuff from just putting some tape on your chainstay to silence your bike to crazy CAD design stuff. So I wanna see them. Everything you can possibly send in, keep them coming. In the meantime, I'm just gonna throw you to two really particularly interesting ones this week. So the first up is from Stuart and it's of his 1995 Kona Explosive. So kind of a retro bike from Rewind as well. And he's been building it up into a retro trail bike one of the problems though is it didn't have disc brake tabs and he wanted to put a disc brake on it. So instead of welding a tab on the bike because he might have wanted to return it to sort of a period correct build, he's made his own 3D CAD model of the frame and with, with a scanner and made a bracket to fix. And he's also done FEA testing to see if it's strong enough. Like this is insane. The detail that some people will go to to put disc brake on. But I don't blame you, I wouldn't run cantilever brakes ever again. So that is like a really, really good sort of I guess that's a hack, like rather than a mod, because you've definitely improved something that was okay, and you've made it better. The next one, you've come up with a number plate mount. Now I'm really into this because number plates when you race can be a pain, you're just putting them on cable ties and they're really messy. I like the fact you've used reflector brackets on there, it looks really clean and tidy, and I guess you can reuse the bracket and just put the, your next number plate on for the next race in the same way. That's a really good mod, and I think actually a lot of you guys that might race want to have a look at that. The next one, this is a particularly long story, so I'm only going to put a little snippet up here now. Now I'm going to put the full letter on Facebook because this is a bit of a crazy story. So essentially, so it's Philip Martin and he's from Innsbruck. He's 30 years old and he works as a medical doctor. In 2016, he had this massive crash and he broke his back. So he broke his collarbone, shoulder blades, some ribs, and he also two vertebrae, L1 and L4. So the fracture of his lumbar vertebrae one was so bad and unstable, they had to get into surgery and basically they bolted some of his vertebrae together. So his lower back was like bonded for eight months. So after a five month recovery, he had all the pins removed from his collarbone and his back and stuff. And the doctor asked if he wanted to keep some of the metal. So he obviously knew what he was going to do with that. And he cut some up and made this little mod for his reverb. So he's, he's basically got part of the bolt nut that carried in his back for eight months with a bit of resin. He's put it on his dropper poster on moat. So... Not only is it a little reminder of how lucky he was to survive that thing and still be riding a bike, but it's actually really functional because it's added more traction to the dropper post. That is one of the best mods I've ever seen. But to top it off, he's done something even better than that. The helmet he wore in the crash that arguably saved him, he's turned that into a lamp. So he's got one of those really cool the Edison bulbs that look really fancy, but it's the LED ones, so they don't heat up. And he's got that as his kitchen lamp and his kitchen table. That is just absolutely brilliant. But check out on our Facebook page, you can see all of his pictures and read the full story. There's a lot of detail to it and he's really inspired by Martin Ashton and a lot, a lot of other people that have had to cope with really severe injuries. Definitely have a look at that. So tech of the week this week directly relates to modern progressive bikes. And what I say by that is the extended wheelbase bikes with a longer reach on them. So we're talking about bikes like the Nukeproof Megas, the Mondrakers, the pole bikes out there like the machine. There's a lot of them and it is getting more of a thing that people like to size up. So that means having a, a longer reach bike and they're shortening the stem length. Now this actually came from Mondraker who developed this system first. When they put out this crazy little stem, so that's effectively a 10 millimeter stem. And the way they got around that was, let's just say the bike was the size medium, the front end would actually be off a large X or an XL of a normal bike, but it would have the medium in height and then to bring the handlebars back into the same position you would normally have, they have this tiny stem. So you're not just putting a short stem on any old bike to get that feel. You've got the bike that fits you properly in the cockpit because of the stem, and you've got this really good direct response, so the steering just feels unbelievable. 
Now these were like really cool, but the downside of them is that you did have to trim down your steerer tube and commit to it because they sit on top of it. It was the only way to get them that short. Now as things progressed, other companies came on board, like Renthorff got this, and Raceface made them Easter, made them as various brands and made these tiny little stems. And this is the 30 mil stem, and that's as short as you can possibly go without interfering with anything. But the tech I want to talk to you about is the Pacenti P Dent system. So it looks like a regular set of bars, they're available in 15 mil rise, 25 mil rise, and they've got a five degree angle and they've got seven degree back sweep. It's a carbon fiber bar, but the cool thing is the stem is only 20 mil. How do they get around that? Because of the profile. That sits around your steerer tube. They can still allow for a certain amount of movement for setting up the roll of the bar. If I show you it in the stem there, you'll see it doesn't interfere with the steerer tube, but you've got this tiny little compact setup. It's one of the nicest looking solutions I've seen, and certainly a lot nicer than the original sort of pioneering stuff that Mondraker were doing. Granted, they've done that stuff, but potentially have looked at what they've done, they've taken it the next step forward. That is progression. That is a really cool bit of mountain bike tech. So that is the end of this week's GMBN Tech Show. I hope you enjoyed the ride with me. It's been really good fun. So make sure when you're commenting and you're sending emails on the address on the screen there, they use the hashtags because it makes it a lot easier for me to get that stuff faster. And that means it's more likely to be on the show next week. So the hashtags are hashtag bike cave, hashtag rewind, that's for the retro. I know a lot of you send that stuff in and you say retro, just hashtag rewind. That means I can find it like that. And then of course, hashtag top mods. Keep that stuff firing in and hopefully you guys will make it on the show next week. If you want to see a couple more really useful videos, click up here if you want to see Blake's video on how to jump doubles. Don't we all want to jump? That is the video. That is the one that teaches you how to do it. And for four ways to improve your winter riding, click down here. As always, click on the globe to subscribe. Tell your friends about the channel because hopefully we're going to be able to help them out with some really good tech info. And of course, if you like the video, give us a thumbs up.